Bonjour. Today I would like to talk to you about <coughs> what we observe as targeted attack against corporate inbox and how we see them different from a personal inbox attack. Uh, before I start, just a show of hand, how many of you use Gmail for personal use? Wow, okay. And how many of you use it for uh, work? Quite a few as well. Great, so I feel like among friends. So thank you so much for staying so late and uh, for the last session. I'll try to make it entertaining because it's the last one and uh, hopefully uh, you remember it. Uh, so all of you who raise your hand, you are part of, you are one of the few, uh, we are part of the people who entrust us with your email. We have about one billion plus users at the moment who entrust us with their email. And this large user base, which also uh, encompasses both end users and company, give us a very, very large uh, and precise view of the threat email landscape. And this threat limit email landscape is quite active. And on any given week, we are stopping hundreds of billions of attack against our users. Uh, to put that in perspective, uh, that means that every minute, we have to stop over 10 million attacks with a 99.9 .9 precision, a little bit above that, actually. So the way we're able to do this, high precision, is to react quickly to emerging threat. And the way to be able to, to, to react quickly stems from the fact that we're able to anticipate how the threat landscape will evolve. So we pay very close attention to all the subtlety of the threat landscape, how it is different, how people attack differently, and so forth. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Uh, here's a concrete example. In 2017, early 2017, we know that we stopped uh, four times more malware to reach our corporate inbox users than our end user inbox. But the difference are not only like at this macro level, they are also sometimes very, very subtle. Uh, let me give you another example of that. Uh, again, early this year, uh, we know that we have prevented nine times more phishing attempts against German science-related company than we did for the US counterpart. This show you how very nuanced and how different are the threat profile we observe through the email threat landscape. So my goal today is to share with you some of the insights we learned about all this threat landscape so you can as well understand where we, we are going and hopefully take that home and use that to prioritize your defense, understand where we're going all together and hopefully all together we can make the internet a safer place, right? So the way it's going to go is first I'm going to discuss global trend, which are the things which affect all of us. And then I'm going to delve into specific trends which are specific to specific type of organization, specific type of like nonprofit. And then we will conclude by discussing a little bit regional specificity which affects some part of the world. So let's start with global trends. When we think about email security, we usually focus on the five main big uh, threats. So the first one is spam that everyone knows. The second one is also obvious, this is phishing. Uh, the first one is impersonation, which is when someone sends an email which is a forgery and pretend to be your brand. The fourth one is malware. And the last one is email interception in transit, which is when an email goes from one email provider to another and someone tries to eavesdrop it or modify it. So I'm going to discuss the largest trend for each of those in turn. The first one is spam. So for spam, the biggest trend is actually something which is more general for the entire uh, Google as a, as a whole, uh, we took the deep learning, um, we focused heavily on deep learning at, in, as a company, and as of end of 2016, we had uh, more than 3,500 projects across Google who, has, who are using deep learning, including, of course, Gmail for their difference, but also Android, Photos, Translate, YouTube, our robotic department, and so forth. So what is deep learning? Um, the best way, I think, to explain it is to give you an example. Deep learning is the next generation of machine learning, which allow us to have ability to extract more meaning out of media and data and being able to have higher precision and higher understanding. Uh, the best example of it, or I would say the most visual of it, is uh, photos. Photo understanding is where it really shines. So here's an example, a concrete example. You take a picture, you're on the vacation, you take a picture of the sea, you bring it home, and as everyone, all of us, you bring too many photos from your vacation and you forgot to tag them. Uh, so what the computer will do with deep learning, it will actually ex understand what's inside the image and add to your images some tags which actually describe what's inside the image. And that was one of the first applications we released publicly through Google Photos and which allow every one of you who use Google product to actually search your photo by tag even if you never tag them. 
This is one of the use cases of where deep learning really helps humans to alleviate the burden of doing something which is not that fun, which is tagging endless photos. You just have to upload them, and we got a lot of positive reaction. People try to actually search for random thing we never imagined, like, oh, can you find me all my drawing? Actually, it does work, and people were really happy about that. So I think this is one of these positive use cases of using AI to help humanity. So this deep learning is also very relevant to spam. This is one thing that over the last two years really helped us to keep our edge against spammer and keep our detection rate above 99.9%. Uh, today, we estimate that the incremental coverage, so how much it add to our existing defense, is somewhere around 3.5%. So this 3.5% is what makes the difference between great spam filter, filter and Gmail quality spam filter that you, I hope you all love. And so that's really what we do. So another benefit of having embraced deep learning as a company is we are able to build a very robust platform which applies to all our product. And for example, we recently announced that we even have developed a hardware technology to help us to scale and make deep learning more efficient. If you want to know more about that, uh, there is a link on the slide uh, to the blog post which announced that. So that was, that's my first trend. Uh, deep learning is what allows today Gmail to stay ahead of spammer, and we foresee that this trend will continue in 2017 and likely 2018. And we believe also deep learning as it trickled down to the entire industry will also help a lot with other kind of trend, uh, trend. So it's more than just a buzzword, it's actually a real thing, and we have seen very concrete and practical benefit of using it at least at Gmail. The second one I want to discuss is interception. So interception happened when uh, Alice wants to send an email to Bob. So she's going to send the email, but Bob do not, sadly do not use Gmail, so we have to send the email to another provider, and in the process, the email is transmitted between the two providers. Uh, usually, originally, when the SMTP protocol was created, there was no encryption. Later on, we added, we added .tls, which is optional, which allows to encrypt and protect against uh, this kind of if dropping. And today, uh, at least at the early 2017, we are happy to report that we have 80% of our inbound traffic which is encrypted, and about 87% of our tr outbound traffic, which is email we send, which is encrypted. Uh, that seems a good victory, but trust me, it took a while to be there, and when we started, it was far from a winning battle. Uh, if we just zoom back three years, in 2014, when we released a transparency report, which was the first time we decided to go public about this, we had only 65% of the email we sent were encrypted, and we only received 50% of our email encrypted. And the way to view it is one email out in two in 2014 were not encrypted to us. So the transparency report uh, really helped people to realized how important it was, and we were able to raise awareness, and as a result, we were really able to bring the industry forward and adopt this, this, this mechanism, which is start CLS to encrypt email, and we saw a jump about 30%. And then, as you can see, afterward, we still had a steady progress, but it was still not enough. The steady progress was too slow, and in particular, the inbound traffic, which is the amount of encrypted email we received, was still too low compared to how much we were able to encrypt. So in 2016, uh, we decided after a long, long back and forth about how much to not disrupt the user, how to convey it properly, and the loss interaction, to release uh, the encrypted lock, lock icon that you might have seen in your inbox. And what it does, it tells you that the email you're about to send is not going to be encrypted, so if you put something which is confidential in it, someone might intercept it in transit, so we help the user to make a better choice. It also helped to highlight to the user, remember now 80% of the traffic is encrypted, so there is only 20% remaining, uh, which one are not paying attention to security, and we hope it's a nudge. So did it work? Uh, the answer is yes, it absolutely works. It actually helped us to get, as you can see on the graph, a huge bump into the amount of our inbound traffic encrypted that we receive, and we still continue to have steady ad adoption. Um, so this is really one of the positive examples where Increasing encryption visibility really helped to drive adoption, and we really believe that transparency is a good thing for security, and we should all embrace uh, being more public about security protocol, security adoption, so we can help everyone around us, which are not as se security savvy than us, to really understand what are the consequences of not having security and what they can do. I mean, you probably know people who work in companies which are not 
So tech technology savvy, but they will absolutely need to encrypt their email. That's really important for them. So what is next? So next big thing for this year is we're going to introduce, with a bunch of partners, a certificate pinning for SSL, for start, for start CLS. So like in Chrome, when you try to go to a website like Google or Facebook, we are pinning the certificate to prevent rogue certificates for intercepting traffic. We'll do the same for email. That's a great step forward. Uh, it's a joint initiative uh, that we carry through MOG and IETF, and every major company are on board uh, with it, including Microsoft, Yahoo, Comcast, uh, us, and a bunch of other big partners. So we really hope that certificate pinning would be deployed this year, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be H1. We don't have a definitive date to share with you, but that's really the next big thing. So that's the ne next big trend for this year is not only we'll have encryption, but we'll have encryption with certificate pinning this year. All right, so the third threat is impersonation, when people try to impersonate your brand and send an email on the behalf of your domain. So to prevent that, there is three technology which exist for a while now. The first one is Dkime, which is used to sign cryptographically emails. So basically, you actually signing your email and say, yes, that's me, with a public key system. The second one is SPF, which basically allow company and organization to specify which server are authorized to send email on the behalf of the company. And the last one, uh, probably the last known of, of all of those, but which is very important as well, is DMARC. And DMARC, what it does, it allows you to specify what to do when a provider receives an email which is not from you. So let's say we receive an email from your brand, but it's not signed, what do we do with it? If you don't have a DMARC policy, we have to put it in a spam folder. We don't know what to do, so we have to deliver anyway that our commitment and honoring protocols. The problem is some people go, believe it or not, to the spam folder and might click on it anyway. So how do you prevent that? Well, you add a DMARC policy and say, well, when you receive something which is not authenticated by me, please reject it. And in that case, we take the email and we just reject it out flat and it never reached the spam inbox. So if you have DCAM and you don't have DMARC, and I know a lot of companies don't have it, uh, it's very important so you actually mitigate further the issue of impersonation. Uh, it's also an interesting tool for you because adopting DMARC allows you to specify a report URL where we can send you statistics on how many email we reject. So you get additional visibility into who is trying to impersonate you. Uh, as for HTTPS, uh, sorry, start TLS, we also decided to surface now that authentication is very, very pervasive, uh, to surface to our user when an email is not authenticated. So when you're authenticated, you have the normal icon, and when you have a non-authenticated email, we decided to show you a scary question mark to say, well, we cannot know if it's a real sender because, well, the domain is not authenticated, so you have to make your best guess. Uh, again, this drive adoption further, as you can see, uh, in 2014, 5.8% of the email were not authenticated at all. As of 2016, end of it, uh, we are at 1.8%. So great progress there as well. But, and we can today say that most emails are authenticated, which is why we're more aggressive in pushing to the user visibility into non-authenticated email to try to reach uh, the small company who sadly don't, are not yet aware that they need to do it. Um, so the most important trend and the thing that needs to be paid attention in terms of authentication is driving adoption of DMARC because we believe it's not enough to put spam folders the email. We should also reject them. It's, re it's better for the user. It's better for the brand. So we are a strong advocate that people should start to use DMARC policy. Uh, if you want to know more about your own reputation to Gmail, last year we also released uh, the Postmaster tool, which you can sign up as long as you have a domain. And it would tell you how much of your email you send as a spam folder, how many are authenticated, if we see anything coming from your server, which is bad. So you have additional visibility into how we see you. So we basically act as a looking glass. We know it was one of the most requested feature. So it's for everyone for free. You just sign it up, and you have to prove you own a domain, and then you have all the analytics you need. If you haven't signed up for it, you should. Or if you, if one guy in the IT department needs to sign up for it, please tell him to sign up for it because we really would like to have everyone using it. We have a new version coming up, and we would love to hear your feedback on that as well. Uh, the next trend is about phishing. So for phishing, uh, the most emerging threat in 2016 
was the rise of financial, fi financial fishing, which is the idea that instead of trying to scam you out as Nigerian princes or getting your password, people would target the financial part, the financial branch of your organization, and ask someone to make a transfer. And the reason why it's deadly is because you are willingly doing a transfer, so it's really hard to revert it, and a lot of people fail for it because the financial branch might not be the one which is the most aware of the threat. And so what happened is basically they pretend to be a CFO by having a Doppler email or something which is very close and say, hey, please wire this money to that guy, it's very urgent, uh, I need to do it by the end of the weekend or something like that, and the person will believe it's the right email and will actually just execute it. Many people fell for it, this is two from the press. Uh, Mattel almost lost $3 million and Loeni actually lost 40 million, dollar, 40 million euros uh, when uh, falling for that. So targeted financial phishing is definitely of the rise. We got a lot of escalation from our client and we help them on that. What you can do for that is increase the level of awareness and the level of education in the financial branch of your organization, which is something we traditionally do not do. We try to do like general thing, I think. In that specific case, the best response is education and focusing some of the resources to educate the financial people about the risk that they are at risk specific specifically and showing them some examples which are available on the internet would help a long way to prevent those scammers to make a ton of money. Okay, last but not least, malware. So what was the biggest trend in 2016? Can anyone guess? It's very easy. Ransomware, yes, exactly. Ransomware becomes the largest malware threat for, by a huge margin. And so a ransomware, for those who don't know, is this kind of binary who uh, will, on, on your computer, will encrypt your file and ask you for a ransom, usually Bitcoin, in exchange of the key to decrypt your file. Uh, one of the group, called Locky, actually overshadowed everyone in terms of volume. I'm going to show you some of the volume number in a, while, in a bit. And so the, that was the number one trend for us in 2016, is Locky as the number one uh, threat in terms of volume and attacks. Uh, many people cover it as well. Uh, what I want to show you is why we pay so much attention to malware and so much attention to ransomware in particular in 2016 uh, by showing you this graph. So how do you read this graph? Uh, the blue line is when Gmail see a payload associated to Loki. So we don't see the binaries themselves because we prevent binary from Gmail by policy. So they have a small dropper, which is either a document file or a JavaScript file. So when do we see them? Well, we see them around 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. on that in May, on May the 4, uh, 21st, and then people decide to upload the same payload about five to six hours afterward to VirusTotal, which is our public services where you can upload files and scan them with all antivirus. So what it means is, from our team perspective, we are the first line of defense, and we see things about five to six hours before anyone else. So there is no community awareness for us to help us, no signatures that people have deployed because when the Loki hit, we're the first line. And what we want is, remember, being over at 99.9% .9 precision at stopping the attacks. So we have to invest heavily into uh, combating Loki. So let me show you a little bit more about Loki because we think it's a very interesting use case and a very sophisticated gang. I know a lot of you know about it. I'm going to show you more about what we see from the Gmail side. So the first thing we saw very early on was that Loki is not one thing, it's actually part of a very big ecosystem. Loki is a group who specializes into the ransomware part of the thing, but they actually use infrastructure which is shared by many cyber criminal groups. Uh, for example, this is a picture of the same week we saw email from Drydex, which is a Trojan banking that you might have heard of, heard of and Loki coming from, the, from IPs that are geolocalized for you. And as you can observe, they come from almost the same IP. The reason for that is because they are distributed through the same botnet. So what you see here is also a very important trend that we have observed over the last five years, which is the commoditization of botnet and the separation of expertise. You have one guy selling the exploit kit, one guy selling the botnet, and one guy selling doing ransomware, one guy doing the drydex, and also drydex are so now training people to use that technology. So you don't have one actor. You have a group of actors which specialize and have, and by being specialized are way more efficient and more precise. And what I want to on phase in the next few slides is what is the expertise of the Loki group? And it's not in network, it's not in traffic pumping. They, they use Necure. Um, to tell you how aggressive they are, I actually should use uh, actual graph from our telemetry. 
to show you what we see in May 2016. So the first thing I want to unfaze, so I compare Lucky and Drydex, and each bar is a day. So the first thing I want to unfaze, and it's really important to understand, we don't see a steady stream of attack. It's not a graph which looks like this. What we see at Gmail is huge bursts of attack, nothing, huge bursts of attack, nothing, and so forth. And when I say huge, sometimes we see 1,000 times more attack email on a given day than the day after. It's also explaining why the number I have in the slide, you should take them as data point and not as an absolute number because ne tomorrow or next week, if there is a huge attack, the number will change a little bit. So we have to look at longer term, longer term trend to actually pick up what the threat landscape is. One interesting thing, as you can see, is both groups have some sort of time delay between each of their attacks. And there is a reason for that. It's not like they go idle and they go on vacation. Is they actually spend a lot of time researching and understanding how they can by bypass AV. Both group, and Loki in particular, spend extraordinary amount of time developing payloads which are really hard for antivirus to be detected. Most of their engineering time, I believe, is spent, or I think a significant amount is spent into uh, developing payload which will not be detected, and that's why you have sometimes a long period of idle and sometimes a very short one because it depends how fast they will be able to find something which will bypass the latest version of the AV. Uh, one thing which is very different from Drydex and Lucky is the volume. Uh, Drydex, at most we see one million email on a given day, and that's not a lot, so they are very, very targeted and very focused on the target list. Uh, Lucky is just like all over the place. This is 100 million email. So they have the ability sometimes to pump up in a few hours 100 email, that's why I call a burst. And it's also why sometimes our metrics, I can't show you like metrics which are 100% meaningful because we have so much variability. Um, and then they go away and then they come back. So also funny anecdote is none of those groups ever send an attack on the weekend. So that goes with the thesis that they are actually uh, professional groups, right? So one thing that Loki did very well is they decided to focus heavily on developing droppers, so that this small attachment they attach to the email, which is in JavaScript instead of PDF or DocX or RTF, because they, they had more, they found out that they have more liberty and AV were less prepared for that, so they are investing in that. And they become really, really good at it. So what does a dropper look like, right? What is it looking like? So this is a simpler version. Uh, it basically has four stages. The first stage is, is you, get a, you create a temporary directory using the specialized version of JavaScript which run in Microsoft, which is called WScript. Then it's going to use an ActiveX object to fetch a payload from a external website, because remember, this is a Google do not authorize and Gmail do not authorize binary, so you have to download it from somewhere else. And then they're going to create, to write a payload on disk. This is when your AV will actually kick in and prevent you from downloading it, hopefully. And then they will execute it. And here you have a empty argument uh, because sometimes they also add a password into the dropper which prevents the antivirus to execute it if you don't have the password. That's one of the tricks they do to prevent analysis. So you have to have the dropper and the binary to do the analysis. If you don't have the password, it doesn't execute and so forth. So a lot of tricks they do there. But that, that's the nice version of it. This is me making you a nice example. In reality, uh, those guys, they do very, very advanced payload. <laughs> Uh, to show you how deadly they are, uh, let me show you a production graph from Gmail. I know a lot of you wanted to know more, like see more behind the scenes, so let me show you what we see. Uh, so this is on May 5th. Uh, you know, it's 2 a.m. in the morning, Pacific time in Mountain View, it's all fine. And then we have, well, 20 million, 20,000 20, lucky email coming in through the pipeline and everyone is detecting it. And our internal detector in blue some of our AV we use as well as confirmation as well. Everything is fine. And then Loki start to kick in. And they're going to pump about 30 million email every hour for three hours. That's 100 million email here for you. And what you can see here is one detector, which is our internal detector, called it. The AV, I could have put this one or another one, and it doesn't matter, actually was blind to it. That's what we see. That is why we spend so much time developing our internal detectors because in many, many cases, what's behind between you and Loki is our internal technology and sometimes it's AV as well, but in that specific case, it was our detector who saved 100 million email to reach our end user inbox, your inbox. Um, so it's also why we don't talk about how we do it because we have a very unique process to detect those kind of stuff and we don't talk about it because we know they're actively looking forward 
to trick our system. And so we are a little bit shy about it because it's for our user protection. Uh, let me show you how they try to trick us. This is an interesting story. Uh, they decided that maybe we do something about file fingerprinting. So if they were to change the file mid-course in the attack, maybe we will miss it. So they started with trying with um, Microsoft Doc, and in the middle they switch to RTF. That's the kind of tries it's this stuff. So they constantly probe our system and say, if I change this, if I change that, how it works, and sometimes it's low volume campaign, and then they full blast on. Uh, here's an, an interesting trick. So as I said, we also have some, uh, they found a way for one commercial antivirus that they were, the commercial antivirus was processing JavaScript and were processing all the comments, and they, so they engineered a comment inside the JavaScript who will actually burn uh, the CPU like crazy. So this is a graph of CPU consumption. You see, uh, with their tricks, they were able to get the usage of the CPU level for the antivirus 20 times 20x. So the reason why they did that is not for making fun of the AV company, but because they know that many mail gateway, if the AV do not respond in time, will just do fail safe and pass the email. So that's a way for, for them to deduce the AV to be able to get to people inbox. So that's one of the clever tricks they do, right? It's just, these are just anecdotes, and it's not to pick on anyone, it's just to show you how formidable this is as an adversary is and how much fight we put uh, against them every day. And they really give us a run for our money, which is uh, quite uh, impressive that they're able to sustain that for a very year, which means they probably make a lot of money as well. Um, they, use, they are also master of JavaScript. Uh, for example, here they use a trick uh, just to show you which is specific to JavaScript uh, on Windows to in, in, in an attempt to say, well, maybe Google is using you know, V8 or Chrome technology, so if we are using a specific thing which are only found on Windows, maybe they won't find it. Uh, the, the week after, they try something else, which is like, oh, maybe they are running a Honey client, and maybe they try to speed up the clock, so let me try to test if actually they execute the thing at real time or accelerated time to, find, to bypass us. Uh, they try to do a lot of fingerprinting on their payload in the hope to trick uh, sandbox analysis and so forth. So they try to evade sandbox, antivirus, honey client, and they have a ton of tricks. I, I could do an entire talk, like 20, an hour and a half on all the tricks we see. It's actually very fascinating how creative those guys are. So I think that the main thing I want to unfaze is even if we don't follow binary, uh, at that point, uh, some of the group we are facing are very, very expert in their field and have a very deep knowledge of the technology. And we always find tricks to bypass one defense. So you should always consider have at least two AV or at least two layer of defense because one will never be enough because they will be able at least to target one. So defense in depth has become very crucial. And that's why we have so many layer of defense in Gmail because we, we can't rely on one of them. There is no single defense which is unpassable for those guys. Uh, also, Interesting to see the, the amount of volume and this huge burst of 100x, right? If you go back to your uh, CEO and say, why do you need so much equipment? Is because when there is an attack, the attack will not be five times more, 5% more, 10% 10, 10 more. You have to really plan for 100 times more uh, to be comfortable that you can sustain a big attack. Um, okay, so let's dig into organizational trend, right? So what is, what is so special about corporate inbox, right? That's why the title of the talk, so a lot of you are here for that, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, the first thing is how corporate inbox di differ from and, uh, personal inbox. Well, actually they are fundamentally different. Uh, we block way more malware for corporate, and we actually stop way more phishing attempt against corporate inbox, but they receive way less spam. You can see it here, the blue bar is the corporate inbox, and the green bar are the personal inboxes. And you can see malware, phishing, so it's like four times more, six times more, but again, as I said, it changed from week to week, so don't pay too much attention to the exact number, but the trend is correct. Uh, we have, we see way more malware and phishing for corporations, that's the main, two main problems. Spam is more an issue for personal uh, end users, and end users, right? So if you do, if you zoom in, and we talk about type of organization, uh, then we also see different. So for example, the most fished type of organization are companies, uh, publicly traded company, privately held at company. The second one are government related uh, organization. Third would be nonprofit, almost on par with education organization in terms of phishing attempts. So if you are a company, well, yes, uh, phishing is something which should be definitively on your mind and you should really invest into prevention, education, that's really important. Um, 
In terms of malware, not the same threat profile at all. Companies are way less targeted by malware than non-profit and education organization, government being in the middle again. So very different threat profile. So if you are running a non-profit, then malware is a big issue, and you should absolutely invest into uh, AV technology. Or use Gmail and use Gmail. Uh, in terms of uh, technology and security technology, it's also important to talk about defense. Uh, we see that companies receive way more encrypted emails than EDU and nonprofit. And one of the reasons for that is corporation and company have probably way more budget for IT security, so they have more people knowing what to do, so they will have more people being able to uh, put forth those technology and they do a lot of B2B interaction. Nonprofit, well, they don't have that much resources and they focus on helping the world, so they might not have enough IT. And again, a lot of the email are from nonprofit to nonprofit, so that's why it explains why it's way lower. So in that space, it means that as a community, we should help nonprofit and EDU organization to step up the game on encryption and authentication so everyone is on par. And again, it's our problem at, uh, of all of us because we are all part of the internet. Um, I can even go deeper. I know a lot of you, some of you come from the financial sector, some of you come from the IT sector, entertainment, so this talk will not be complete if I don't show you some sort of benchmark by sector, so let's go that. Uh, the most spammed sector is entertainment, followed by information technology, uh, and followed by, ha uh, by real estate and housing. As of 2016, early 2016 to be, uh, 17, early 2017 uh, for sure. Uh, how about phishing? Well, who would have guessed that financial and insurance company were the most fished? Of course, followed by entertainment, which was a little bit of a surprise for me, and information technology. That are the three main uh, targets for phishing attempt, at least early 2017. So, and as I said earlier in the intro of my talk, uh, there is a lot of nuance to all of this. So we can actually zoom one step closer, further, and go to how about the sector by country, right? So let's do that uh, for the financial sector because that's the one which is the most fished. And there, you see that for IT and finance, the threat profile, the original threat profile, is different. For example, in the IT sector, the most targeted one is Brazil. For the financial sector, what we see is Japan. Again, do not pay too much attention to the size of the bar. It's more to show you that there are all those nuances and we take them into account. And depending on where you are located, depending on what is your sector, you'll have a different threat profile and you'll have different things to, fight, to face and uh, you knowing them actually help to prioritize what you should do. Like if you are from the financial sector, phishing should be differently than your number one priority if you're a nonprofit, as I said, malware is the number one. How about technology? Again, technology in terms of security technology, uh, most people encrypt their email, but there is still a 30% difference between entertainment and let's say uh, in finance, in infer uh, finance and insurance in terms of receiving email. So some of the emails they receive are less encrypted. Uh, so we're still not on par evenly across the board. Uh, one explanation is some sector use big email provider or trust, don't trust their email to people like Google or other big company, whereas some of the other sector might do it themselves and the sysadmin might not be aware that it should really enable sort TLS and so forth, which is why we try to reach out to them. Uh, this slide is more to show you how much variation we can observe. Uh, we, see, we saw a large uptick of malware against real estate company in early 2017. This is not a trend. This is just to show you that sometimes our metrics goes off balance for one sector just because there is a big attack. Uh, this has receded since then, but this was uh, the case, I think, a week or two weeks ago. Okay. Before concluding, I would like to talk a little bit about regional differences. Uh, the first one is uh, about the adoption of security technology. Uh, one of the things which struck me the most, and I wanted to highlight it today, is that European companies are a little bit lagging behind the rest of the world in terms of encryption, of authentication, and hopefully they will catch up soon. In terms of spam, uh, the most spam countries are India and Japan. Now the question is, can you guess who are the biggest spammer? US, yes, and which number two? Which number two in the world? No, no, not, not China at all. Actually, the, the three biggest countries who send the most spam is actually US, Germany, and France. So the reason for that is because those three companies have historically 
being in the center of the internet and they have a lot of internet exchange points and a lot of bandwidth, so a lot of servers are hosted there. So in reality, uh, when you look at the sender side, the reason why I show you that is to show you that when you look at the sender side and the rezoning is completely different. This is about the attacker will be where they have the most capacity for the cheapest price, right? Unless you run a botnet, and as we saw for next year and like dry deck and so forth, it's in poor country which have low, more a higher percentage of uh, non-patched machine. But if you are talking about servers, those guys will go into the U.S., will go to Germany, will go to France, where bandwidth hosting is cheap, so that's where you can have your main, most bang for the bucks. Very different one people think. It's not China, it's not Russia, it's literally where bandwidth and server are cheap. Um, and to show you another one, um, because I know a lot of people are concerned about phishing, see this is a trend for phishing as early 2017. Uh, Japan is probably the one where we stop the most attempt against our corporate inbox uh, in terms of phishing as of uh, the last few weeks. So to recap, uh, one of the things you can take home is that deep learning is here to stay, and that's really what gives us at least a Gmail and Edge to combat spam and other threats. It's really made a difference, and if you're running any, any kind of machine learning algorithm, that's something you should pay attention to and start to try to use. Uh, the tools are currently really become very easy to use, including uh, Google own release TensorFlow, but there are also li library. Uh, the other thing is transparency also helps driving adoption of security technology. So if you're working on a security product, thinking on how you can expose indicator of security to your user will help. Even inside your organization, uh, if you show that, yes, this person has signed a document and so forth, actually can help. Transparency and making people accountable is actually a good way to push security forward. Um, and last but not least, uh, each organization has its own unique threat profile, and the reason why it's important is when you make a decision, should I focus on A or should I focus on B, because you don't have the time to do everything, then knowing where you should focus is probably the most important thing, and it's the most important thing at least for us to really know what is the next thing we need to build. And so we hope that what we show you and the little tool I showed you uh, help you to f see a little bit better where you fit into the email ecosystem. If you want to know more about uh, some of the lessons we learned and more like general understanding of how we protect and how we build our system at Gmail, uh, last year I did a talk uh, about the lesson we learned. Uh, you were, uh, it's on, available on YouTube. I will also have the slide online uh, so that you can learn that. Uh, so thank you very much for staying so late and being here for the last talk. Uh, if you have a few questions, I'm, we gladly take them. If you can step up to the microphone, and uh, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, when you say that uh, 80 and 87 percent of email is encrypted, is that referring to uh, corporate email or across the board? Worldwide. All Worldwide. of it. Yeah, don't distinguish between the two. Yes, 80 percent. All right. Um, so uh, arguably the most impactful phishing campaign uh, last year was the, uh, the phishing attack that got John Podesta to enter his Gmail credentials and... Uh, resulting in the breach of his inbox. And this, this was a fish where uh, it was actually posing as Google security in order to trick him into going to a phishing site and entering all his password. So I, my question is, with all of this technology behind you to stop attacks, how, how do attacks where the attacker's actually posing as you manage to slip through that? And is, it, is there a... Have there been any changes at Google as a result? Thanks. That's a complicated question. Um, I'll try to answer it. Uh, a, um, I'm not sure that's the most impactful one. I mean, impactful depends on your perspective. For us, impactful means how many users are affected. I can see your point. Um, for phishing, there is no difference which are perfect. We always say it, and you can always say that one email passed through the, through the filter, that's true. Um, we, that's why we, for example, offer every our user to actually switch to 2SV and use the security key because that's the best defense against uh, phishing. Uh, we see a lot of people trying to impersonate Google as well. Uh, it's not a new thing. We try really hard to push back against it, but anyone can claim to be Google in an email because they just write our brand name and there's nothing we can do about that because we can't prevent all email mentioning Google. So you're right, there was, this was an important incident. And there was many things and many learning out of it that we took into account. One last question. 
All right. What is Google trying to do to deal with uh, look-alike domains or cousin domains? To do what? Look-alike domains or cousin domains. So we have currently a warning. We say, hey, this is not usually the email that your sender is sending from. So we already have a warning for user to raise awareness. It is extremely difficult because uh, sometimes a company might have, for example, Google have Google.India, Google.com, and sometimes people use Google.India, Google.us. We have all of them. So sometimes it happens. It's really hard to have a definitive judgment. So the best thing we try to do is surface at the UI level when we think it's a lookalike and it's really weird. Uh, that being said, you're right, it's extremely dangerous. And um, there is not a good way to, or like a perfect defense against it. So we do a bunch of deep learning inspection of the content, and as I said, we surface some warning when we're not sure. Thank you very much for your attention.